three lectures that are based on museums and history centers in DeKalb County. So this will be the third one in the series. It's from the southern part of the uh, county. And we'll have, I think, five or so groups of people, for, representatives from those museums who will come and share what they have going on, exciting new projects that they've got, how you can visit them. Um, so that will be at the History Center. No. No? Oh, it's going to be down at the Sandwich Public oh, Library. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah, so we're going to take our show on the road. <laughs> so don't go here or the History Center. <laughs> um, and then we'll be from noon to one o'clock, as always. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. I don't know. I think we need to minimize this. Go down. Find that. Try that again. I see Dan here. You're the owl expert. Any advice? <laughs> oh, that's the way to do it. Okay. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Success. <laughs> Let's just go forward one and make sure it syncs up online. It works. It's a little different. It's the version that's on your computer versus on the screen here, but we're we're gonna okay. make it work. We're gonna go with it. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, what I want to talk about today is some updates to our uh, rest restoration plan and talk about where we started with it and where it's headed. So new findings and restoration planning. Some of you have heard components of this lecture over time, um, but I want to do a kind of a brief introduction to the project and then launch into the things that I find really interesting. And I'm hoping that you'll find those things interesting too. It gets detailed as far as um, wall colors and, and decorations. So uh, I think you'll find it to be interesting. Our project started, believe it or not, in 2014 um, with the Jeffers Family Foundation reaching out through email and just said the question in the email subject line was consider a partnership with the Jeffers Family Foundation. Normally, I delete those emails. But you know what is this? Who is the, who is this? But I read it, and the question was, one of the directors of this organization. There's three people involved. Said, "I'm traveling throughout the Midwest. I'm visiting historic homes. Uh, it was suggested to me that we might be a good fit. I said, please come." Um, and the the gentleman arrived. He had 45 minutes available for us. Um, he then called me that day and said, "I'm running late. I have about." 30 minutes total. I'd like to see the house in 15 minutes and then I'd like to talk for the other 15 minutes. He's like, okay, <laughs> one of those tours. Um, but he is a guy who, his name was is, is Royce Yeeter, and he is um, involved in Midwest preservation, he worked for the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Chicago for many decades. Uh, and he walks in a house and can size it up pretty quickly. And we talked for probably five minutes and he said, I think we can help you if you're willing to work with us because we have a variety of steps necessary in order to uh, be a partner. So uh, I had that meeting. He apparently went back to Janesville, Wisconsin, where the Jeffers Family Foundation is um, situated and had a conversation with Tom Jeffers, um, the, the founder. And Tom called me the next day and said, I had a nice talk with Royce. I'm interested in your site. What was your visit visitation last year? What was it the three previous years? And I'm going to ask you for a lot of other information. Like, all right, all right, let's you know, let's get started here. So I shared those those numbers, and then he just kept hitting me with more questions, more questions, and it was great. Um, his family was involved in the Parker Pen Company, and um, he worked for Parker Pen for a while, but with his parents set up this foundation in the 1970s. 
And since then, he's been funding um, historic preservation in smaller communities throughout the Midwest. Uh, he feels like places like Chicago and maybe Madison, they have enough foundations and money available that they don't need it as much as we do. And he's right. Um, so this is Tom standing in front of a Louis Sullivan Bank building in Ohio. Uh, one of their uh, recent projects, a uh, little jewel box of a, of a bank. The first step in order to be a part of their program is to have a historic structure report. So this is a document that goes through every component of your building and makes recommendations of how you restore it, top to bottom. Uh, one of the goals is that is so that you don't do the wrong thing in the wrong order. No sense in restoring the interior if you have a leaking roof. Um, so that's where you start with those projects. Ours, I don't remember, it's probably 150 pages or so. Um, it took a year and a half from the restoration firm to go through it. Um, but just to give you an idea, we did a, um, an RFP um, to ask you know, restoration firms, first of all, are you interested? Here are the qualifications of what we're looking for. We had nine firms get back to us to say that, yes, they're interested. Uh, they then sent in proposals. The values of their work ranged from about $60,000 to $100,000 for this project. The Jeffers Family Foundation pays for 50% of this component. Uh, and then these are the organizations that paid for the other kind of 50 percent. So we did our annual appeal. So many of the people in the room uh, made donations to it through our annual appeal in 2015, I believe. Um, the Roberts Family Foundation, Eco Lab Foundation in Naperville, um, the Cub County Community Foundation, and then Coles Cares, um, Coles Associates who help out at different organizations. They came about five times and helped just all over the estate to, to give us money from Coles. I think it was $500 each time. So it was great. Uh, and it was always fun to have them on site. Uh, but this was the idea. We got this historic structures report. And like I said, it took about a year and a half, maybe two years to get the final document. But it was, it was eye opening for us because we thought we knew a lot uh, about the site. We do know a lot about the site. Uh, the guy who did the report for us is from a firm called Restoric. His name is Neil Vogel. And he told me that there's a historic house in um, Mays Lake that he's been working on for 15 years, and he thought he had a lot of documentation about it. He said he surpassed it with the information from us within just months. He said it's a lot to go through. And um, some of you might remember, he and I went to the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming. Uh, where the Elwoods sent their archives off in 1957. Uh, lots of material. There were over 200 archival boxes of papers to go through. Now, we didn't get through 200, but we got through maybe 45. <laughs> but in the early uh, days, there was uh, correspondence with the first architect of the mansion, George Carnes. Um, so this is a letter that we found in the archives dated 1885, and it was our first discovery. We, this is a floor plan of the mansion. So the front door is here, the rear rotunda is here, and eventually the conservatory is added on to the back here. Um, this is the servant's wing. On the first floor, it's the kitchen, and then cook's room, and the third floor is maid's room. We assumed that this was done in 1898 as part of this phase of construction, but we found out it was 1885 through this visit. We also found out that Elwood and his architect got in a fight. Uh, <laughs> that letter talks about how it's Garnsey writing a letter to Elwood saying, I've always been fair with you. I've never treated you as a rich, rich man. And um, I don't know why you're giving me such a hard time, essentially. He's like, I'm not charging you any more than any of my other clients. And in fact, I'm probably charging you less after all this time. It just Garnsey was here in town working on multiple projects for Elwood. Um, the Lewis house, which at the time was located across the street, uh, he was working on the mansion, he was working on a couple other things. So I think the bills just kept coming in and now we got a little jump. Uh, of course, at that point in time, 1885, yeah, was, we're making a huge amount of money every year. Um, so the architect's bill was like nothing, nothing at all. So this first discovery for us was important because it dates our kitchen um, on the first floor in 1885 instead of 1898. Um, lots of changes occur. I'm not going to get into that, but there's a lot of changes in the areas um, between the first floor and the, the what is now the dining room. Uh, but that's easier to talk about on a tour at some point rather than on a, on a 
a slideshow. This is the basement level of that floor plan. And I just want to point out two things, which I think are very interesting. We always knew these things were down here, but we never really pinpointed it to um, what it was. So here in the back of the house, this is the basement level of the rotunda is the back door. Right now it's embedded within other space. So you go through the back of the mansion on the ground level, there's a boiler room and there was an old coal room and then there's another room next to that. Uh, and then eventually when you go straight through, there's this back door. Well, that's the 1879 door embedded inside and it has its original paint on it. Now it's faded and it's really marred up over the years from probably coal men and ice men and who, who knows how many people went in and out of that door. Uh, but that gives you an idea of the coloration of the mansion in 1879. This is even more fascinating to me. This is the back wall, which occurs here. So inside that 1885 wing that I just mentioned with added on is the original back wall of the house. Mm -hmm. So here it is with a window with bars on it and then the original brickwork. So here's the window here. Uh, it's not the best photo, but it's hard to get in there because there's all this stuff around it. Um, but this shows the original brickwork of the house. So again, Elwood was maybe a little on the cheap side. And instead of using the brick that was suggested, he did more of a common brick because he had access to it and he was using it in his factories and other places in town because he was always building something. Um, so what they ended up doing is putting a render over it, or like a veneer. And on top of that veneer then they did the mortar joints. So all these joints are applied to the surface of this rendering. So just imagine scraping that across the brick to get a smooth surface and then adding those joints in place. We know from correspondence that that's failed very quickly. The render came off and Elwood wrote a letter to his architect and said, I want to paint it. What color do I do and how do I do this? I was like, whoa, 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 settle down. <laughs> um, if you're going to do that, here's how it should be done. Uh, but we've had problems with the masonry of the building since the start, essentially. Uh, but fascinating to have that kind of entombed in that 1885 wing and then, of course, this back door in place. And incidentally, the window here, the woodwork matches the coloration of this door. Okay, so to be successful with the Jeffers Family Foundation, you have to have your historic structures report. He loves ours, by the way. Um, and then you have to, or we have to, as a board and a staff, declare how much we think we can raise. And it's an all or nothing thing. So you declare to him, I want to go for this amount of money. If he accepts that proposal, then that's it. You're, you're, you're locked in. So we were pretty conservative. It's like, all right, if we raise $650,000, he'll chip in $325,000. So he'd only do 33% of it, one third, uh, which would give us a total project of $975,000. I was comfortable with that. I thought, yeah, we can hit that number. Uh, a couple of our board members wanted to go higher. Jerry Johns, I mean, we know Jerry Johns. He's like, we can do more than that. We can do more. Um, but I was like, let's not. Anyway. Um, once you get that number, you apply to the Jeffers Family Foundation. They determine on the foundation level if they think we can raise it because they work with a lot of different organizations and they don't want it to not be a successful campaign. So sometimes they steer organizations one way or the other and say, We're not sure you can raise that kind of money. They told me, Go for it. Um, and then you have three years to raise your portion and no going back. And, and like he says, it's all or nothing. So uh, it was it was a little bit of pressure, but it was good pressure. So here is the breakdown. Three-year campaign. We ended up with about 105 donors, and in total, with Mr. Jefferson's contribution, about 1.4 million dollars. Huge amount of money, and you know, thank you to all of you in the room for partic participating in that campaign. Um, it's going to do a lot of good for the mansion, and um, it's surprising how the project. Has not necessarily changed over time that it's just refined that scope of work and how we've investigated more and more. So we're working with a preservation architectural firm um, called Sullivan Preservation. And Sullivan teaches uh, preservation at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, she's a practicing architect and she's been doing preservation work for decades. Um, she's assembled a team for us. And initially what we thought was the project would go out in one bid one public bid uh, through the park district. And since the climate has changed quite a bit as far as constructing and working with contractors and pricing of materials, 
um, we decide that it's actually go out in seven different packages so that we're free to save money that way instead of having a major general contractor who's upping prices of all the different components. So it's going to go out in seven different bid packages. I've got just a little visual breakdown of each one. <laughs> Third floor air conditioning. You don't want to be in the mansion today. Uh, 85 <laughs> degrees and humid on the upper floors. Uh, it's going to take care of some plumbing issues we have on the inside, and it'll insulate that attic, and then also insulate uh, another component <coughs> that I'll talk about in a minute. Electrical rewiring in key areas. Um, it's interesting. We had a, a document in our board packet um, from years ago, decades ago, that said like all the electricity has been updated in the mansion. Not sure what they were talking about because no. <laughs> We did a survey with an electrician. We found there's seven different types of wiring styles in the house that are active from knob and tube, the earliest form of electricity from 1898 to current day. Um, some of the things that we've encountered, the architect and the preservation team, like, no, no, that we're fixing right now. Uh, the knob and tube, surprisingly, is, is, is pretty stable uh, as long as it's embedded in a wall or some sort of area where people aren't touching it or getting involved with it, it it's okay. Um, but we want to be careful with all of our little push button switches and junction boxes that that's not not into running through there. Um, this is the example of the switch panel in the main hall of, of the house. So you just get an idea of the amount of lights that you can control and turn on uh, in this one location. There's certainly more than that around. But the, um, the electrical survey is eye opening. So we'll work on that. Storm windows with UV protection. These front windows in the mansion, this is looking out on First Street, this is the front library. And um, these windows don't even have storm windows on. Some of the others have aluminum storm windows that were probably put on in the 60s, but these don't have any. It's an important place to have them. Um, but we have the opportunity to do a laminate, a UV laminate in the glass, so it will protect all the furnishings from, from the sunlight. So that's gonna be a great uh, upgrade. We're not gonna be able to do all the storm windows, we're just gonna do them in the key areas uh, where we will need to control um, the wind flow uh, because of our HVAC system or because of the UV lighting in highly decorated rooms. Carpentry. This is a picture of the conservatory back wall. It's honestly just completely rotted. Uh, there's two by fours coming down here from the ceiling, but they actually don't connect to anything. They just kind of terminate six inches or eight inches above the header. And I can't even call that a header, it's just a window that's in place. Is that, this has been here for about 100 years. I'm shocked that it's still there, <laughs> uh, but we'll fix it. The ceiling is lap glass and it's leaks. Um, I think ever since the park district fixed it in about 2007. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe it's been leaking for probably 40 years off and on, even when the Elwoods were here. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Masonry. The blue outline areas that you see on the slide presentation here are areas where the mortar is going to get ground out of the brick and then it's going to be left open over the winter so that the air will dry out the brick because there's so much moisture built up inside. So there's a front bed of mortar and then at the back of the brick, the back, the backing has another row of mortar. So that will protect the interior over the winter time, but the rest will be able to breathe and dry out because there's so much moisture coming in these different places. Um, that package has already gone up today, so we should be able to do that this fall. And then the interior decoration we'll talk about here in just a second. So the first major room on the first floor is the dining room. Um, there's some water infiltration area in this roof that's above the back bay. I know this is kind of a confusing slide with the images. So this is the back bay of the dining room with all of our radiators, and then this is the ceiling above it. Um, so two things going on. We've had water infiltration, some electrical problems with this fixture here. Um, and then below this radiator is this cavity. It's almost like a crawl space underneath the bay of the dining room. This was an addition in 1898 to the space. Hello. Do you need more chairs? Audrey, maybe you can help get some here. Yeah. Um, the pipes are not insulated under that space, so it needs to be conditioned all the time. Um, what we're able to do is insulate the entire cavity and insulate the pipes and then put in a small heater so that if it gets below 50 degrees, 
the heater kicks in, or say 55 degrees. Um, if we're able to do that, then we can turn down the heat in the entire management of the winter time, which could be a real benefit when it comes to, of course, the cost of natural gas. But also by doing that, the uh, relative humidity in the building will go up over the winter time, which is helpful for all the furnishings. Now, in the living room, we've got a few things going on. Um, we're going to work on the ceiling. For those of you who have been in the mansion recently, the ceiling has some problems. Um, the paint is flaking in areas. Uh, we used to have a family of raccoons who lived up in the upper <laughs> level there. So there's um, urine areas throughout. So we're going to take care of that. Um, and then we found that there's a little too much contrast in our current ceiling. Um, so through paint analysis, we found that it's going to mellow it out a little bit more. Um, so that's nice. I've got, I've got the color for that. The cove lighting's from 1912. That's all the up lighting. Um, I would say that it was probably replaced in the 1940s. It's kind of a tray light now with an extension cord that plugs into an outlet. And there's another one and another one and another one. <coughs> Um, we're able to streamline that all into LED cup lights, um, and we'll put it exactly where the lights are currently, and it'll have a rheostat on it. So we can dim it down to what would be appropriate for 1912, but then when we're cleaning and doing work in there, we can turn the lights off. So that's going to be really helpful. And then when it comes to things like curtains, I'm going to hit that in a minute, and then um, furnishings as well. This photograph dates from about 1914, 1915, right when this room was restored. And our goal is to bring it back to that photograph. Um, it's really helpful when we're taking tours through the house and um, showing them a historic photo in the room. And then they really get the sense of how authentic the house is. because We have that furniture. We have the stuff. Uh, and that doesn't always happen in historic houses. There's lots of curated furnishings, you know. But we're always, or I'm always telling people how Elwood House is so unique because it is so very authentic. Sometimes you go in historic sites around the country, around the world, and it's, you kind of feel like a little plastic, plasticiness to it. You don't get that with us. You get more of a kind of grit and grind. Uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Curtains. Um, these are kind of the bane of my existence right now. Um, the ones we have now are probably from the 60s, maybe a little earlier. Um, they're just a single panel that goes all the way down. They're they're rotted and they're kind of falling off the rods right now. Um, what we want to do is return to this time period where the upper curtain um, it covers the upper part of the window sash here and then the lower either door or window in that room. And then here's IL and Patty Elwood. She's showing off her fabric, but what we're really looking at here is the curtains uh, and the weight <laughs> to that and uh, you know what we're seeing um, through the, the window too. So here are samples of fabrics, white, off-white, ivory, really exciting stuff. Um, multiple weights, multiple um, companies. I've looked at probably 300 different swatches of fabric online, which is really hard to do with fabric. And then when you think you have the right one, you can order the samples. So I maybe have 10 samples coming from a different company. And they'd come, and I would grab Donna, and we'd go into the mansion, and we'd hold them up in the windows, and they'd no, 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 no. <laughs> um, so after doing that with maybe 36 samples, we found what we liked. And it was um, Schumacher Company, which is really high end draperies, right? Uh, the one that we chose that we liked the most, we ended up not getting to the $75 yard, and we need a lot of <laughs> yard of fabric for this thing. Uh, but luckily, we worked with. Um, uh, this woman in town named Patsy Schauer, and she does preservation work, she does painting, she does wallpapering, and she does fabrics. Um, so she makes curtains, and she's made curtains for us before for the nearing house and for the, the mansion. And I said, this is what we want, but we don't want to pay this price. And she said, give me some time. And, and she came up with it. She found, uh, she works with this Mitchell fabric company, and she found the, an appropriate fabric for half the price. So um, she's going to start working on those over the fall into the winter. Furnishings. Um, this big chair is not one of my favorite chairs in our collection, but the Owens had it there in that room in, in 1914. We have it in the basement because it's been without a foot for a long time. <laughs> and look, it's really ugly. Um, <coughs> underneath that fabric, all right, I cheated and I pulled back the fabric a little bit. There's another fabric underneath. 
I don't think it actually matches this fabric. So maybe there's another layer under that, um, but we can get this restored and put in place to, again, authenticate that kind of scene that the visitors are seeing with it. First floor. I got these last night at 9.30. Um, the paint analysis expert, his name's Tony Carcsonis, who lives in, in Michigan, and he travels around the states, and he does this work everywhere where he's peeling back layers and layers um, to find what's original. So here he is on a ladder in the first floor hall, just looking at the stenciling that's extant. Um, but what he did was he takes samples of every wall, every coloration, every cornice, every piece of plaster, and then he takes them home and looks at them under a microscope. And he goes back through the layers. And I know that on these walls, there's already like eight layers of paint. Um, and then there's canvas, and then on top of canvas are additional layers of paint. Well, he brought it back to the 1880s, and it's somewhere between these two colors. Um, the, the system that you, they use is called the Munsell system to get the accurate coloration. But he said, if you want to look at Benjamin Moore chips, it's between these two. So you're looking at Benjamin Moore there because I'm more familiar with that. Um, but it's more of a, a kind of a tan gray instead of a tangy yellow color. Um, this is an approximation of about 1912. And this is the, the earlier schematic. And I'll show you how it plays together. This is typically what a ceiling uh, coloration would be. Uh, then the wall, I'm sorry, you're not seeing, of course, what it really looks like because it's computer screen over computer screen. Probably the laptop version is a little cleaner if anyone can see that. Um, and then these are the colors in this stenciling patterns. So you can see it's very harmonious. Um, George Garnsey, who was the architect of the house, he used this color scheme. He even had printed in um, one of his books, because he's a publisher and writer. Um, oh, well, how many colors the Elwood House uh, is? If anyone here knows Roger Key's uh, Restoration Guy in town, he went to the Art Institute of Chicago and looked at one of Garnsey's books to um, find the color chart that one. And then he's actually used it for a painting our little house. Yeah. So familiar <coughs> colors to us. They look good together. Uh, it'll be a, a nice clean flow in that first floor and in the staircase going up. So imagine this on the ceilings of the staircase, probably even under the, the stair risers where the plaster ceiling is above you, and then on the walls. And then of course in the coating, you've got these colors. This is the current um, stenciling in the first floor hallway. And we're just going to clean this one up. It's, it's there. It's in decent condition. It just needs some help at this point in time. This is a ceiling that pretty much crumbled in the 1980s. Uh, there was a meeting taking place inside the mansion. There was kind of a crash. The canvas that covered the plaster fell down and <clears throat> so did the plaster. So this was rebuilt then. 1980s, they the had a lot of plaster falling down for the same so they re stenciled it. Examples of the plaster we have in the archives. Uh, but again, we have this because it gives you that original coloration. Um, so you can go back and study it. This is a drawing of what was found on the back of a piece of canvas that covered one of the stenciling patterns in the cove around the cornice. So you can see how the, the paint experts will go in. I mean, they're artists, really. Uh, they'll draw what they see and then um, replicate it. Conservatory. This is the space in the very back of the mansion. And this is that on the lower level is that door that we looked at earlier. Um, we talked about how this all needs to be replaced in the ceiling as well. Here is two other things that we want done. There's a, um, a handrail that gets you almost to the top of the stairs. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so when we ask people to come in and out this door, it's kind of a leap of faith for the first two steps. It's like, hold on to the wall, hold on to the door frame, and then you'll reach the, the handrail. We're going to extend that all the way up to the door. Um, and then we're going to have property that was always fixing. They've been fixing the Elwood house for years. I think today you can barely open it. It's a struggle during the community. Um, and then the other door is just a kind of a park district -y door, I'm going to call it, a metal door. Um, that's not appropriate. The light fixture will be rewired, cleaned, and rehung. Um, some of you have heard my story before that we located this exact same light fixture in use in the uh, Burnham Library at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, 
Um, they have them hanging in the reading room. Ours are, I believe we measure them as 12 inch and theirs are 16 inch. But we found the uh, manufacturing company in Chicago who made these. I don't remember the name right now, but they're located at like Jefferson in Washington, um, in an area that now is completely you know, torn down in different buildings. Uh, but it was a big lighting manufacturing store. So this, to me, this light fixture is very important. Um, at one point, it was on the front of the mansion. It was the main light on the front uh, portico. Uh, but they always like to reuse things, so they just moved it to the back of the house. Later on. Uh, I talked about that black glass that's been leaking for years. It is tempered glass, so if something does break and fall, it won't hurt us. So that's that's the nice thing. Uh, but it doesn't keep out the weather, which would be better. <laughs> um, we do have a lot of plants in that space, so it is kind of a benefit that they get watered from time to time. <laughs> 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 um, here we are. The roof is leaking. They have plants so, in that area, so from um, time to time they get Elwood. This is Patty Elwood, older brother IL, and then young brother Johnny. Um, Johnny was born in 1919, so we're dating this photo to 1919. You can see the flooring is this black and white tile. They start showing family members of the Elwoods. A handful of kind of snapshot photos of them in this space. Um, so they use it as almost like an alternative um, breakfast area. I think the kids had lunch out there because they were wanting to see pictures of them eating on the table. And I think it was just a more casual spot for mom to be with the kids, much like the sunroom became um, at one point in time as well. And I think, or really the architects think, that that was an open air space until about 1990. Uh, and that's when some sort of roof went on. And then that roof was probably only lasted a few years and that was torn off and another one and another one and another one. So it's been a long time coming that we're going to fabricate an actual real copper canopy that will go on there. And it'll be kind of a, a lifetime canopy instead of you know, redoing this every few decades. And that's one of our goals with this project is whatever it, we do, it should at least outlive me. You know, because I don't want all of you complaining to me like, oh, that project that you did, it's not good enough. I want to be gone. <laughs> um, so at least 50 years, but you know, if we can get more out of it, that's great. The stair hall. So again, this is the main staircase in the back rotunda of the house. I don't have photos that do that space justice. You just have to kind of, if you've been in there, you have to envision it. There's a cornice that runs all along the top that would have similar decoration to what you see here in the first floor hall. Um, these are the same colors that you saw on the previous screen. I know it looks different here, but they are the same colors. So imagine this color on the lower part of the wall and this as the ceiling color. Um, this is a variation of it, but it, it's not cleaned of all the wallpaper paste that kept the canvas on. And then on the second floor, again, cornice uncovered, and then the second floor hallway decoration, which I'm going to get into in just a second. I told you we're kind of getting the weeds on this one, but I wanted you to see the, the decoration um, that we're, we're coming up with. And then this is the third level of the stair hall, and then below this cornice line here, so it's the, the dome is above that. You've got the upper dome and the lower dome, and then this cornice. Um, really neat stenciling work was uncovered under the canvas there. So we'll be able to get all of that done as part of this project, including taking the canvas off the stairs, the stair ceiling, and we expect a lot of crumbling can, uh, plaster to come down and we'll replace that. And then on the second floor hall, so this is how it works with Tony. When you hire him, um, you ask him to do a paint analysis of specific areas. And that might be him taking an exacto knife and kind of punching it through the plaster, take this little print sample away that he then looks at under the microscope. Or you can ask him to create a window, which is, you know, excise a piece about this big, you cut into it, and then you get all the different layers out of that. So Tony's supposed to give me a window here. And he's working in the mansion. I'm in my office, and he calls me and said, I made a window. It's, you know, four inches by four inches, and I just get this brown color. It's kind of ugly brown. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, do you want me to make a bigger window? And I said, yeah, if you don't mind. Because I mean, we charge us by the window. So I didn't <laughs> want to get too extreme. So his window became this. 
And it's like, Brian, I found something. <laughs> so <laughs> stenciling is being revealed. Um, so I'm like, all right, Tony, how much would it cost to create one big window, remove all that canvas off the ceiling? And it was like $2,000. And I was like, okay, this is, this is needed because it's gonna give us information. Um, so we removed all the canvas to find all this um, kind of a vine motif. Um, it's dirty, it has again, um, residue from any sort of paste that kept the canvas on top of it. But this would have been from the 1881 color schemes. And then we think that the canvas was put on in about 1898, 1899 to cover the old decoration. You know, it's out of style, let's put something over it. Or the plaster's cracking, when pieces are falling down, let's put canvas on it and keep everything in place. We did have to put um, washers and screws into this ceiling just to keep everything together because the plaster itself was delaminating a little bit from the black behind it. Um, when we want to stabilize it, he'll come back, remove those screws and inject it with epoxy and then put pressure on it to hold it all in place. And here's Tony again looking on the walls for stenciling. Um, the process down here is um, a fairly mild paint stripper. You put a layer of that on, and then you wait four hours, six hours overnight, and then you scrub that off and see what you find. Nothing. You go back in, you do it again. Um, so it's a long process, but the idea is you don't want to burn through your decorations. You have to do it carefully and consistently. Uh, in one case, he just ran out of time with some of it, and I had to go back and finish the process. I'm like, now what do I do? Um, so he's like, you know, spray it with this, scrape it with this, rub it with this, and then eventually it reveals some sort of pattern. Not a pattern that's discernible to me, I'll tell you that. Um, it's really hard to see those different um, decoration um, patterns and stencils unless you have a trained eye. Um, so he came back with a sheet of mylar, and then he takes a sharpie and he draws what he sees. Completely different than what I saw. And then he marks the coloration. So uh, that's why he's a pro and I am not. <laughs> and then I've just got two more slides. This is a project that we can't do right now, but it's fascinating. This is the upper dome. So you've got this part of the dome and then the inner part of the dome. On this outside here, I've got another photo to show you the detail and then coloration in the upper part as well. Right now it's just solid color. So here's what we're seeing. And again, a, a window that we created. Do you see this? The top rail of a baluster. Here's a balustrade, our balustrade here of individual balusters, posts painted on, like looking out the railing at the top of the Elwood House Museum. And then over the front of the mansion, we've got vines and flowers. There's a flower. Um, so that entire dome had decoration all the way up. <laughs> um, we just didn't know it was there, so it's it's fascinating. Um, it's going to be about ninety-five thousand dollars to do that, so we're not going to do it for a long time. <laughs> uh, it'll be another phase of restoration. But the important thing thing for me is that we know it's there. We have documentation of it, and we we can go back to it at some point. Um, Tony's goal is to. And I don't know if we'll be able to do this or not, but he wants to remove all the canvas and expose it and then do something to consolidate it so it's stable. Um, I still think that's going to be very costly because just to get the scaffolding up that center rotunda, that level is like $15,000. We'll have updates on this in the future, that's for sure. But it's an interesting pattern and you can just imagine how that space will change. Okay, master bedroom. Um, again, this is a project we can't take on right now because there's a lot of unknowns yet with it. But this is a photograph that's fairly new to us. An Elwood family member shipped it to us and said, I think this is inside the Elwood Nearing House. I should have sent it years ago. I didn't, but do what you can with it. I was like, no, 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 this is inside the mansion and this is the master bedroom and uh, the small chamber off of it. Um, we've never seen it. We barely have any historic photos of the inside of the mansion from this time period. Uh, and we've never seen all this decoration and stenciling before. So just recently, again, Tony sent me uh, a piece of wallpaper blur. It's not exact, but it's a similar flow and a similar motif. Um, and he's going to do some research based on that to try and track down manufacturer and at least get ideas of color scheme uh, of what we have. So that acanthus leaf that we're seeing in the blue here, 
there's the same kind of leaf that we see twirling around on that. So again, in the future, that'll be a project, but it's just nice to be collecting the information now, now that we can. So that's all I have right now for this presentation. Um, it's pretty cool. It's detailed, um, but really decorative, which is great. Um, it's hard to sell someone on the idea of um, doing exterior masonry in the house. Like, you know, who wants to put their money toward that? But when you can put your money, you do? Okay. <laughs> but um, when you can do it and you show people the decoration, it's, it's really just exciting uh, to, to move forward on it. Any questions for me? Yeah. In the, in the dome, when yeah. we were talking about that, was it an actual repeating stencil or was it more like a mural? You know, it's it's hand painted. It we don't know enough of what happens beyond exactly. what we see, but my guess is it's it flows pretty freely. Hmm. Um, he said the artist who did that is a higher caliber artist than the person who did the second floor ceiling. Like, okay, I'm gonna take my best die and have him do the dome, and then maybe the understudy is gonna do the ceiling on the second floor. And, and just one follow-up, did you find any of the stencils that were you know, used, put up and No, but, but you're right. Sometimes the when they would be doing an actual stencil, um, they would kind of practice it on a different part of the house and that would get covered up later. We haven't found anything of that nature yet. And the, the ceiling of the second floor also looks like it was freehand. So I don't know how much they used with the stencil versus how much they just painted. So it is, it is kind of interesting. But yeah, I think the entire dome is just free hands. Someone just say, I've got a vision, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Getting back to the uh, beginning of your presentation, you said that the um, uh, Elwood sent their archives to the univers um, University of Wyoming. Why Wyoming? That seems out of context with everything we thought we knew about. Yeah, yeah um, Wyoming started their, their archives, basically history of the American West. And since barbed wire was such a good component of that, they kind of came here and said, you know, we'd love to take it. The Elwoods were also working with um, Earl Cater, who was in the archives at NIU. And no, he was a history professor at NIU, and there wasn't yet an archive. And he suggested it would go there as well, not knowing that NIU would eventually have a brilliant archive. And well, I sure wish it would be here. It's a shorter trip. <laughs> We'd all be in there doing research right now. Like, all right, I need all of you to study at least one box, and uh, yeah, we know so much more. But that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't share that. But yeah, and Wyoming is far, far. Mm -hmm. so, anything else? Was it painting? Well, is the painting? Well, um, uh, well, is the painting? So all these pictures were inside the mansion. Yeah, it was amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it was from 1879. Yeah. And we have more pictures of it in the other room. The picture. In the gallery. In the gallery, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? When do you think all the work will be finished? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when I said we started 2014, I thought we'd be done by 2018. <laughs> um, right now, the projection with the architect is we could be doing the interior work in the spring of 2023. I don't think that's going to happen, honestly. And the further out it goes, there's a question of if we're going to save money or lose money. Because um, right now the prices are so high on things, we could think that maybe it'll be better or maybe it works. Yeah. So we'll see. Part of it is just getting the architects and the team together because they're so busy right now. Um, Luckily, they're moving our package forward, but when we send things to bid, just trying to get the contractors out is difficult. It's like we don't have time to bid more projects, we have too many projects. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, that's a good question. I don't know. 2024, yeah, <laughs> Jefferson Foundation are they generally one and done, or are they likely in your years ahead to maybe come back and put a similar offer on the table? Tom is a big planner. So he always wants projects in his pipeline. And last month he said, are you ready to talk about phase two? And I said, no, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I said, can I get back to you on that? And he said, absolutely. So that's good. I mean, it means he's happy and he's excited about our project. 
because he's he's done these projects before. Uh, I, I learned that about him early on from talking to other people. Just like you know, you want him to be excited about your project, otherwise he, he doesn't have to go forward with another phase or another part of it. So um, no, he's he's been down to Elwood House a couple times. He likes it, he likes eating lunch on the hillside. He just finds the town to be um, I think he calls it humble and, and kind or something like that. So um, he's a good guy, I like him. Well, thank you everyone. I appreciate you coming.